take out this piece of paper entitled, Discover Your Shape for Serving the Savior and Do It. The bottom line is do it. You got a job to do, an assignment. First time I preached here at First Baptist Montgomery was in the summer of 1981, 43 years ago. Frazier, you weren't even born at that time. I preached here on a message, and it was one of my favorite passages, Jonah 4, 6. I'm sure many of you have memorized it. I, I don't know why Mark hasn't used it yet. But Jonah 4, 6 says, and God appointed a worm. And at dawn the next morning, it attacked the gourd vine and it withered. Doesn't that just bless you? (laughs) It it blesses me because if God can appoint a worm, he can appoint a wolf. (laughs) And he can appoint you to do his work, to go his way, to perform his will in the world. You see, that's what we're going to look at today. And now... As we come to Ephesians, let let me take just a moment of uh, personal privilege, and I want to share with you three things. Number one, uh, would you show this picture of this new little baby? And and, uh, oh, oh, come on now. That is Robert J. Hall, named for Andrew Robert and named for his granddad, okay. <laughs> and that Mary Austin, oh, it's something. She named Robert J. Hall. Now, they're going to call him Rob Hall, but when I take him fishing, I'm going to call him J-Boy. <laughs> so, Robert J. Hall has arrived, and did you know, today is Mary Austin's birthday. Yeah, she, she's 35 years old today on June the 30th, and what's more, 12 years ago on June 30th, on this very stage, she got married to Andrew. I got her a husband for her birthday. (laughs) Oh, they're doing so great. And so I wanted you to meet Robert J. Hall. And then let me take a moment to praise, to praise God for Mark Bethay. I absolutely love and adore and support 110%. Mark Bethay, there's not a finer young pastor in America. We are so blessed to have him, and he merits our finest and best support as our servant leader, as our pastor, and he and Brittany are an amazing team. And number three, did you realize that this sanctuary, it came online 20 years ago. Now, I confess, I still call it the new sanctuary. It's not new. But it's new to me. We uh, built it 20 years ago, and I'm here to tell you that the MVP of the building process is Burke Sylvester. Would you pop, pop that up by, by Burke? All right, now, Burke, I, I was at a wedding yesterday for his granddaughter, Mary Kate Holditch. And that Burke Sylvester started with me in 1996. And we banded together in the sacred quest to create this space because our dining room table had run out of space in the sanctuary across the way. It would only hold 600. Beautiful place, museum quality, but it would only hold 600. My first year, we had 325 new members, and and the dining room table was running out of space. What were we going to do? Just tell people to go away, go to hell, we don't care? No. So we undertook a daring quest to build this new space in old downtown Montgomery between the jailhouse and the courthouse. People were saying, time out, time out. That's pretty risky. The debt could sink this church. Georgia marble's pretty expensive. But we knew if it was God's will, it's God's bill. And we pressed on. And we banded together. We built this incredible church. But for 15 years, Burke was the chair of our building committee. Can you imagine it? I mean, he went through a heart attack. He went through every kind of situation that was difficult and pressed on. And I love that Burke and Pat Sylvest because let me show you something. This building, it didn't just pop out of the ground. No, it was built and it was a lot of work and it was a lot of money. But did you know, because we followed God in faithfulness, 
We defied all odds, and within three years, this building was totally and completely paid for. Praise God. Oh, amazing. This is an amazing place. It's a sacred place. Yes, I know it's just a building, but it is a building that has allowed us to expand our capacities to bring them in, to build them up, and to send them out. And we did it together. Well, let's uh, look at one more thing. Now, I want to ask you a question. The question is, what are you doing? What are you doing to serve King Jesus and to grow his kingdom? Maybe you're not Burke Sylvest or Mark Bethay. You may not be Mother Teresa or Jane Ferguson. You may not be Billy Graham. But what are you doing with what, what God has given you to build his kingdom? I heard about Billy Bob and Susie. They were 18 years old. They were starting to date. And Billy Bob had been reading some Shakespeare, and he was feeling romantic one night under a bright moon. And he looked at Susie, and he said, Fair maiden Susanna, I wish I had a thousand eyes to behold you. I, I wish I had a, a, a thousand hands to hold you. I wish I had a thousand lips to kiss you. Susie said, Billy Bob, why don't you just use what you got? I think that's what the Lord's going to tell you today. You don't have to be Burke Silvas. You don't have to be Billy Graham. You don't have to be Mother Teresa. You just be you. You be the person that God made you, and He has formed you. He has equipped you to serve His purpose. He has given you an instruction book called the Bible. You know what the Bible is? Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, B-I-B-L-E. And He has given you his word, which contains his will and way, which prescribes his work for you so you don't waste your life. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to ask this question, what are you doing in the name of Jesus to serve him and advance his kingdom? And, and make a mark here, will you spectate or participate? That's the question. Will you spectate or participate? Quick story. Um, over on the right-hand side of your outline, there's a picture of a man named Jim Taylor. I went to New Orleans Seminary, and at New Orleans Seminary, the greatest sermon that I ever heard was not from a professor, it was not from a pastor, it was from a football player named Jim Taylor. Now, those who know your NFL football, Jim Taylor was number 31. Who's that beside him? Who's behind him? Who's that number 15? Bart Starr from Montgomery, Alabama, neighbor of Billy Irvin, actually. And here, Bart Starr, all-star from Alabama, Jim Taylor, all-American, LSU, playing for Vince Lombardi and the Green Bay Packers, totally dominant, beat everybody, won the first Super Bowl. Well, when I went to New Orleans, this young man who was from Baton Rouge, went to LSU, played for the Green Bay Packers, he lived in New Orleans and was a member of the church where I became the youth minister, the Memorial Baptist Church in Metairie. In my first night, I'd gone to Wednesday night. I was the new youth minister, 1979. I come back to the kitchen where a lady named Melba Hall is fixing this fantastic Cajun meal. Oh, man, it was good. And I took my dishes back to the kitchen, and who was washing the dishes? Jim Taylor, wearing a Super Bowl ring. Jim Taylor was washing the dishes. I said, it's such an honor to meet you. And this humble man said, uh, I said, man, I'm, I'm impressed to see you wash the dishes. He said, you know, if I could knock down linebackers, I could knock a little dirt off a dish. <laughs> what an attitude. He was a servant because he got it. Do, do you know what Jim got? He got the most basic truth there is about being a real Jesus follower. Jim understood that Jesus had served him Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. That's what he did on the cross. He paid the penalty for my sin, which is death. We learn in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, the core of the gospel. He who knew no sin became sin on my behalf so that I could be made right with God. That's it. 
And once we've received that service, what do we do with it? We emulate Jesus. We become his servant. But why do you think Jim Taylor had a dish towel? Because he was serving. If Jesus served him, he's going to serve King Jesus. That's how it works. It's a simple equation. In John 13, Jesus washed the disciples' filthy feet, and after he completed it, he stood up and he said, you've just seen an acted parable. Do what I've done. Paul amplified it in Philippians 2, have this attitude in you, who was also in Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, humbled himself and became a servant. So this is the call of God for my life. It's the call of God for Jim Taylor. It's the call of God for your life. Are you carrying a cross and a towel? Because friend, if you truly understand who Jesus is and what he has done for you, you have no other option. So the question comes, will you spectate? Will you sit quietly on the sidelines? Or will you participate? Will you use the gift of your life to make an earthly and eternal difference in the name of Jesus? All right, so let's come to the Scripture. The Scripture is from Ephesians, and the Scripture is a simple admonition beginning in verse 8. It's very familiar, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And, And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, so pull it out. So we're saved because we trust Jesus, not because of our works. And we're saved as his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to go to work to serve. And that's further described as we come over to chapter 4. Look at chapter 4, verse 11. It says, and Christ gave some to be apostles. These are servants and roles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, till you look like Jesus, the servant. Let's pray for a moment. Dear Father, dear Father, I pray earnestly that you would get me out of the way, that these titanic foundational truths about following you being saved to serve, would permeate down to the deep regions of our soul and that we would live these truths out every day. I pray that you would take these seeds of truth and deposit them into every receptive heart. And I ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you one more example and then a quick checklist and we're nearly through. The example is a man named Albert Schweitzer. I did a paper on Albert Schweitzer when I was in seminary many years ago, and he's one of the most fascinating missionaries on the planet. Schweitzer was born in what is now Germany in 1875. He was a phenomenally brilliant person. He earned four doctorates, three at the Sorbonne in Paris. He had a doctorate in math. He was a phenomenal musician and organist. He had a doctorate in music. (laughs) He had a doctrine a doctorate in theology or ministry, and then he got a doctorate in medicine. He was a medical doctor. He could do anything for anybody on any team on the planet, and yet he signed up with the French Medical Society to go to a place called Gabon on the western coast of Africa, bury himself in this jungle, and in the name of Jesus, start a medical missions hospital and serve. 1952, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and he said the most stunning statement. When he received the Nobel Peace Prize, he simply said, the only ones among us who will be truly happy and fulfilled are those who learn to serve in Jesus' name. Friend, do a quick self-analysis. Are you truly happy? 
Do you have this sense of joy and fulfillment in your life? Could it be that the missing ingredient is serving? Could it be that today you need to make a shift from being self-focused and self-serving to Jesus-focused and (laughs) Jesus-serving? You see, that's the key to set you free, to learn to serve. Well, here's what we're going to do. Let's discover how to serve as we see our shape, our shape. You want to serve in alignment to how God has made you. So this is essentially a, a quick checklist. Here's your shape. Identify, number one, S is for spiritual gift. Spiritual gift. Scripture says, 1 Peter 4, that each of you should use the gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. In other words, everybody has been given a special endowment, a tool for building the kingdom of God. Now, there are spiritual fruits and spiritual fruits that would be like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Spiritual fruits replicate the character of Jesus. Spiritual gifts replicate the ministry and conduct of Jesus. That's how it sets up. So you've been given a spiritual gift to build the kingdom of God. (laughs) When when I was a kid, let me put it where everybody can get it, okay? When I was a kid, as a birthday present, and I think you get, when you're born again, a birthday present from the king, from your father. I I got one time my favorite birthday gift. I got a Zebco 33 rod and reel. Did any of you ever have a Zebco 33? Oh, man. Leah, you had a Zebco 33. Okay, impressive. So I had this Zebco 33. And I, I was so proud of that rod. And my dad and I would go fishing all the time. And I can remember I took that birthday gift. And you know what I did with it? Did I just set it over on the side? Did I let it rust up in the garage? No, I did not. Man, the second day I had it, we went fishing. And I went fishing with who? I joined my father. And I went fishing. And do you know what I caught? Fish after fish after fish. And I fed my family with that Zevco 33. You see, that's why God has given you gifts not to let it rust, not to let them be forgotten about, but go and join your father with your gift and feed the family. Make a difference. Catch fish. Jesus said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. All right. So two, add to spiritual gift after you discover, develop, and deploy them heart. Heart. That's what the H stands for. It says, Samuel speaking, serve the Lord with your whole heart. So that prompts the question, what is your passion? What makes your heart beat faster? What are you enthusiastic about doing and pursuing? I think at First Baptist, all of the people who have different passions for things, and one of the greatest things I believe that we do is our tutoring program. Our tutoring program has been here as part of our ministry since 1988 when Jane Ferguson started it. And that tutoring program has made a difference in thousands of lives because we don't just tutor one time a year. We tutor the entire school year every Wednesday night. Many of you have been part of it. I know my wife has been part of it, but at the heart of it has been Steve Roberts and Bo Cooper because they have a passion for young people. You know, when you look around Montgomery, you see some young people in trouble, do you not? Well, of course, we see a lot of young people who are lost and wondering, and do you, do you know what the real issue is? Most every problem is L-O-J, lack of Jesus. So when we saw that these young people needed spiritual help because they were failing in their classes, instead of cursing the darkness, we decided to light a candle and do something about it and start a tutoring program. We've done it for years. We're continuing to do it, but our volunteer pool is shrinking. Do you want to do something about Montgomery's problem with crime? and educational deficiencies. We can wring our hands and curse the darkness. Or on Wednesday night, somebody ought to sign up for being a tutor. You can't save all of the starfish on the beach, but you can save that one. And maybe God would give you that one that'll make the difference. I'm so glad that people had enthusiasm for the tutoring program. One more quick story. When I got here in 1991, our broadcast ministry was really good. We'd had it since 1957, but it had grown deficit. 
and we decided to bring it in-house because a guy named Harold Hancock, he said, I'll do it. Went to Alabama State, took some courses on broadcast, and he partnered up with a man named Hugh Naftal. Hugh Naftal was a World War II hero in the Battle of the Bulge. I mean, unbelievable guy. But he was hard as nails, and he did not have a heart for Jesus until he got radically saved. He showed up at this church in the 1980s. Came to me and he said, Jay, I've wasted about 50 years in serving Christ, and I'm going to make up for lost time. The Lord has given me a heart for video, and I'm learning it. And I hear that we're going to start doing our own television broadcast. I'll help fund it, and I'll help do it. He bought one of these really fancy Commodore 64 computers. Wow, isn't that amazing? <laughs> Commodore 64. Okay, not even Apple. And he started to work on that Commodore 64, and I'll guarantee you Hugh Naffro gave thousands of hours to this church. And we started editing the broadcast, and our Arbitron ratings at one point in the 90s were up to 40,000 extra people per Sunday watching on WSFA. You see, we have this incredible hidden audience here, and it was augmented because Hugh Naftal had an enthusiasm or a passion for video. So my point is, what's your assignment? What is your gift? What is your tool? What are you excited about? All right, let's go to A for aptitude. Your aptitude. God has given you certain skills and abilities. It says in Colossians 3, whatever God has given you, use it for Him. Remember this, your vocation may not be ministry, but you can do ministry through your vocation. So whatever your skill or aptitude is, use it for the kingdom. P is for personality. You see, God has given you a certain wiring. It's almost like when you're a woodworker, you always first look at the grain of the wood. Your personality is the grain of the wood. So you work with the wood. Some people are, I love the pictures of the animals. Some people are lions like leaders. That would be Peter in the Bible. Other people are like otters. They're socially connectors like Barnabas, who I highlight. Maybe you are like Matthew. Matthew is that beaver, the doer, the CPA, the one who gets it done, the administrator. And then there's John, the golden retriever. He was the one who would not leave the side of Jesus. So I would urge you to know your personality type and then operate within it. And then lastly, your experiences. Your experiences would be your background, your education, your work, even your problems and suffering. And God mixes it all in this bowl called Romans 8, 28, and He'll take everything and make good out of it for the glory of God. We're about to see that in the Hope Hills camp that starts today. Many of you know the story of Jason and Catherine. She had a horrible stroke 16 years ago, and out of that misery came a ministry. That's uh, Hope Hills camp from last year. It'll start today, and It'll go for four weeks. There'll be over 2,000 people coming, many profoundly disabled. They've raised the money to pay for them totally. They will come to Camp McDowell, Jasper, Alabama, and they will minister to people at profound and life-changing levels, all because Catherine and Jason's pain became kingdom gain. That experience became something that was a tool for them to use. Let me show you one more picture. This is an amazing story. You see the young lady, that's Nan McMahon. If you look closely, she's missing her right leg. Jason and Catherine and my grandson are embracing her. She was a freshman at the University of Georgia, and during summer break, she went out on a boat, just having fun like you would at Lake Martin. There was an accident. She came out of the boat. The propeller ran over her leg, cut it off almost at the thigh, and her father, in trying to save her, was killed. She woke up in the hospital the next day, missing a leg and her father. What kind of devastation do you think that created in that young woman's life? Unimaginable. So less than a year after the accident happened, she hears about and shows up at Hope Hill's camp. What kind of ministry did she receive? It was life transforming. All because... Jason and Catherine had a negative experience that they're now using for the glory of God. Well, let me wrap this up because I could go on, but I've got to 
ask that lastly, lastly, discover, then deploy. Do something. Do something in Jesus' name. And I would suggest that First Baptist Montgomery is one of the most extraordinary churches in America because we are a ministry and missions laboratory. I believe that if Jesus showed up in Montgomery, he'd come downtown. He might hang out right here. Because we didn't run from the need. We had the opportunity to move somewhere where the need wasn't so great, but we stayed here. We stayed here as a ministry laboratory to make a difference in the name of Jesus in the lives of countless people. That's why we have our caring center. The, the, I got to tell you one thing. The caring center, I, pop up that little picture of the caring center. All right, let's see. There's a, there's a telephone number, 241-5141, and that's Charles Hamilton's number. We desperately need volunteers for the caring center. I mean, we are at a very low level of volunteers. And if we do not find some more people to come work at the Caring Center, we're in jeopardy of its effectiveness. So pull in with me. And if you can give one day a month, we need you to do Matthew 25 and be the hands of Jesus at the Caring Center. Well, I'm going to wrap this up with a, a story, um, a, a testimony from Larry Epperson, Dr. Larry Epperson, one of my favorite friends. Many of you know that 15, 15 months ago, Larry was diagnosed with glioblastoma. It was devastating. And uh, I asked Larry one day, I said, how are you dealing with it? He said, King Jesus has called me to serve him 100% while I have time. And that's God's message to me. That's God's message to you. Listen to Larry. It was a very tough diagnosis as a neurologist to digest because we were taught in medical school and uh, in a residency, look, somebody has GBM, they have one year to live, so take care of their seizures and bring in hospice when it's appropriate because they've got a year to live and nothing really works to cure this. So it was tough to digest. And I'd wake up every morning that first month and said, did it really, did I really have a GBM uh, or was it a dream? And uh, I felt my scalp, and, which was very sensitive at the time, and said, no, I really had a craniotomy. Mm. 38 staples in the side of your head. I did, metal staples. And, um, uh, and then went through chemotherapy and went through uh, radiation uh, for six weeks and then another six months of chemotherapy, which was tough. It was a tough uh, time, lost some weight. Um, and a great uh, amount of reflecting on life and what's uh, the Lord having, my, what's my future? Um, I don't make long-term plans. Uh, three months, six months, a year out. I just look forward to every day and uh, maybe the weekend, and Lord, thank you. And I say, thank you, Jesus, probably several hundred times a day because my face isn't droopy. I can see out of the left side of my, of my vision. I can move my left side, and uh, I can speak. And so, man, I'm just thankful to be alive and walking, talking, and going to work. You're still seeing patients? Still seeing patients, still working. I get a little tired. Part of that may be age, but I get a little tired. But I, in my mind, if... God lets me work, he's letting, he's letting me live. And that's the way I look at it. And so it's an incredible opportunity to share with patients. And many patients know what I've gone through, so it's a great opportunity to share Christ, to pray with them, and uh, to just, uh, just love on them and just, uh, uh, just lift the name of Jesus, glorify Jesus every day, every day. Larry, um, we learn in Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, I've not come to be served, but to serve. Hmm? and to give my life as a ransom for many. Because we follow Jesus, we follow the Jesus way of love, purity, and serving. Amen. You've always been a servant, and now you're at a different place in your obstacle course. And as you go forward, what are you gonna do in the coming days to continue to serve King Jesus? I'm gonna to continue to, to lead, let Jesus lead me. And it's nothing that I've done. It's I'm leading. Jesus is leading me. And I believe there's a, there's a reason that I'm going through this wilderness. That there's a reason we all go through wilderness. And ultimately, for a believer, it's to glorify God. And um, he says, whatever you do or eat, uh, 1 Corinthians, do all for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, do for the glory of God. And that's, that's the purpose I have right now is to glorify God in everything I say and do. But again, to point him to Jesus, I think one benefit for me was to be able to teach Sunday school, to continue to teach Sunday school as I got into the Word. And so uh, to stay in the Word has been key. And I think I dug deeper in the world, in the Word, uh, having, having this GBM 
And uh, where else are you going to turn? As a believer, there's nowhere else to turn. Honored to uh, be able to share and to even sit and talk. It's, I'm just so grateful and so thankful and uh, have an attitude of gratitude every day. Um, I mean, to get up every day for me is just the greatest thing in the world. It's the greatest thing in the world to get up and talk and walk and look in the mirror and check my face and make sure it's not droopy and I can see. It's just a, what a, just a great journey. So thankful that uh, the Lord has allowed me to, to be where I am right now. And uh, what an opportunity to share Christ. It's the greatest opportunity. It's actually so easy to share Christ with what's happened to me. It's, it's just a joy in the journey to share Christ. As Paul says, it's a fragrance. It's a, a sweet aroma when you share Christ with anybody. It's just the greatest. It makes my day to share Christ with anybody, everybody, and uh, to pray with them uh, and um, point them to Jesus is the greatest honor in my life. Like Larry, you were saved to serve. Let's pray. Oh, Father, you lovingly call us to salvation and then to serve. Seal this message to our hearts and motivate us each day to take up our cross and our towel and to serve you with our best. And may for some, that start now. Pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen.